one day in the hospital, two little boys were lying on stretchers uh, just outside the uh, emergency room right next to each other. The one boy leans over and he asks the other, well, what are you here for? He said, well, I'm here to have my tonsils out. The first fellow said, well, no big deal. I was four and I had mine out. They put you to sleep. You wake up, eat lots of ice cream, give you jello, and it's, uh, it's a breeze. So then he turns to the other and says, well, what are you here for? And he woefully says, I'm here for a circumcision. His newfound friend next to him goes, oh, that's bad. That's really bad. He said, I had that shortly after I was born, and I couldn't walk for a year. <laughs> uh, some things are just common to uh, mankind, temptation being one of those. Would you turn with me, please, to 1 John uh, chapter 2? And uh, we saw from chapter 1 in 1 John, beginning in verse 5, all the way through to chapter 2 and verse 11, John was exposing the errors of the false teachers that had permeated the church. And remember the statements in 1.6, 1.8, and 1.10, uh, if we say, if we say, if we say, he was showing what the false teachers were saying and then also what they were doing. Uh, then we saw in 2, 4, 6, and 9 the statement, he who says, again, pertaining to the false teachers. Then we had a transition from the errors of the false teachers to the true church. And in 12 uh, through 14, just last week, we observed that John wants us all to be spiritual fathers. Uh, Paul would say in uh, 1 Corinthians 2.15, that individual that is spiritual judges or appraises, and listen carefully, all things. So John wants us to be spiritual mothers and fathers of the faith by knowing God and walking with Him for an extended period of time so that we can show others how to imitate us as we imitate Christ. Now today, as we transition to 2.15, he's going to reveal for us not only Satan's methods, but the, the means of the false teachers. And now he's writing to the believers and he's saying, these are the things that you ought not to do. So here in 1 John 2, let me read to you 15 through 17. Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world is passing away, and the lust of it. But he who does the will of God abides forever. Would you bow your heads as I lead us in prayer, please? Father, such a small section of Scripture, but yet life-changing. Father, uh, what we do with this section of Scripture determines, uh, Father, not only how we will live, whether victorious or defeated, but also then how our children will live. This is a big deal, and I pray the Spirit of God would impress upon us this morning, Father, just how it is necessary that we have the love of God to fill us and not the love of this world. The two are incompatible, and I pray that we would get that message today and act upon it accordingly. I commit it to you now, Lord, because only you can bring these truths home to us by your indwelling Spirit. So I ask in Jesus' name, amen. Uh, what we're going to see is John's going to give us three reasons why the love of God is incompatible with this world's system. They are oil and water, if you will. And let me just with that share point number one. We'll jump right into this. Stop loving the world and serve only Jesus. That's point number one. Stop loving the world and serve only Jesus. Jesus. Uh, our Lord had made this statement that you're familiar with, I'm sure, in Matthew 6, 24. No one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will be loyal to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. 
How true is that? So you have to make a choice today. It's sort of like what Joshua does in uh, Joshua 24. He takes the nation of Israel to the fork in the road, and he says, hey, as for me and my house, we're going this way, which is the right way, which is God's way, but it's up to you to make a choice. This message is that way today. You will sit here, and you will have to make some tough choices on how you are going to live. And I just pray that you have the humility today to allow the Spirit of God to search your hearts in order that if there are changes that you need to make, that you humbly make those changes. Uh, John begins with the statement, Do not love the world or the things in the world. Do not love me, agapate. It's a present imperative. That's a command. And the idea with the present imperative here is to stop it. Stop loving the world. And I know what you're sitting there thinking, well, what in the world is the world, right? How do you define what the world is? Cosmos is our Greek term. Uh, interestingly, John used that word, that term, 79 times in his gospel, and then 24 times in his epistles. Sometimes it means mankind. Uh, that's how we saw it used in 1 John 2.2. 2. Remember that Jesus is the propitiation, the sacrifice, not only for our sins, but also for the whole world. In other words, when Jesus died on the cross, it was unlimited atonement. He died for everyone. That's how the term is used. But concerning here in 1 John 2.15, let me give you what some are saying about the term here. Dr. Charles Ryrie. The world is that organized system headed by Satan, which leaves God out and is rival to him. I like Dr. Ryrie's definition. I, Howard Marshall, worldliness means disobedience to God's rule of life, and his presence is to be discerned by asking, what is God's will? And not by making a human list of taboos. Warren Wearsby. Worldliness is not so much a matter of activity as of attitude. And then John Wesley, and uh, he goes back to the 1700s, anything that cools my love for Christ is the world. Hmm. Therefore, stop loving this world system. But I want you to understand today what you're up against. Uh, come over to chapter 5 and verse 19, because this world system is everywhere. You ever wondered why when you go to the grocery store, why do you have to listen to that seductive music? Or when you go uh, even to a restaurant and you're going, you know, why, why is that playing? Why am I subjected to lyrics that are ungodly? Because, you know, for the child of God, Remember what David says in Psalm 40 and verse 3? That he has put a new song in our mouths, even praise to our God. Many shall see it in fear and will trust in the Lord. See, when you come to Christ, you're a new creation. All things are supposed to pass away. And I, you know, I just want to be really honest with you here. It takes a long time. <laughs> God started digging in my heart when I got saved at age 16. And all of a sudden, there were certain things that needed to go. And you're all just kind of nodding, because those of you who have following the track, you know what it was like. There were certain things you watched, pertaining maybe to violence or that were immoral. And you go, well, that's got to go. My, remember why God destroyed the earth, by the way? Do you remember that back in Genesis 6? Because the earth was filled with violence. So we're not supposed to drink that down like water. And if you grew up like I did, hanging with people that like to fight, watching things pertaining to violence would put you in the wrong frame of mind for the Christian life. And then the music. You have the music you grew up on. Basically seductive lyrics, many of them. Doesn't matter which genre you came from. Many of the types of music out there just pertain to the lust of the flesh. I don't even need to say that to you because you know. But in this day and age, and, I, I, and you have to understand this, child of God, we are a privileged culture in America because you can find Christian music in all types and genres. And I just encourage you to start to put off the old and take on the new. And why is this important? Well, this is what I'm going to ask you. Do you want your sons to be thugs? Do you want your daughters to come home at age 15 and 16 and say, hey, mom, hey, dad, I'm pregnant? 
Whatever you fill their minds with, that is what they are going to be in their life. That's just the way it is. Paul commands us to bring every thought to the captivity of the obedience of Christ. And I know this, and I know this experientially. If I'm pumping godless music in my mind, and I'm taking in uh, worldly videos, that this is how I'm going to think, and this is what I'm going to carry out, is how life works. And you, as a Christian parent, you are to train up a child in the way he should go, so that when he is old, he will not depart from it. It's on you, Mom. And a child left to himself, the proverb tells me, brings his mother shame. Why? Because the mother was the primary person in the home with the children. So this is very important. And the decisions you make today and the humility that you put into play will make a huge difference. Whether you and your family lead a, a victorious Christian life or you are like so many other Christians I know that are just worldly that come home with the pregnant children, that come home with violence. Now, everybody get this and understand I'm not, I'm not cracking on anybody here. People are individuals. They can grow up in the best Christian home on planet Earth and still make the wrong choices. It's the way it is because we have free will. But what we need to know is the nature that you feed, that's going to get strong. So if you take the upper half of your body, and you work it out, but you do nothing in the lower half, I can just tell you something. You're going to have a muscular upper body and a weak lower body. Same thing with the spiritual life. If you take and you feed that part of you given to Christ, that gets strong. But if you feed the other, then the other develops the muscles. But they're done that. So you know what I'm saying today. So this is heart to heart. This is me to you. This is as someone who spent 10 years as youth pastor. This is someone that is coming up in 30 years of pastoral ministry. I know how it works. And all the pastoral staff here wants is for you to have Christ in your lives. That's simple. So we have some definitions. And then John goes on to say here, if anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. Back to the world. Listen to James chapter 1, verse 27, and then we're going to get over to James 4, 4. <clears throat> James 1, 27 says, Pure and undefiled religion before God and the Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their trouble and to keep oneself unspotted from the world. You've got to make a choice. Am I going to let this world system with the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life infiltrate me so that I get spotted with this world. Now, listen, you, you can't have it both ways, child of God. You really can, according to Jesus. James says it this way in James 4.4. 4, Adulterers and adulteresses. To whom is he writing? Christians. Then he asks this question and expects a yes answer. Do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? In other words, if you want to put yourself at odds with God, embrace this world's system. Take in the lust of the flesh. Take in the lust of the eyes. Take in the pride of life that it will find shortly, and you will be at odds with God, and you will find that your arms are too short to box with God. James really hits the nail on the head, does he not? No one can serve two masters. Paul's on his deathbed. Who are you going to call for on your deathbed? Well, I'll tell you we couldn't call upon. In 2 Timothy 4.10, he says, For Demas has forsaken me, having loved this present world. The now world is what it says in the Greek. And has departed to Thessalonica. So, we want to make sure, child of God, that we stop loving the world, but while we're actively serving Jesus. Point number two. This is an informational point, but an important point. The allurements of this world are not from God. The enticements from this world don't come from God. That music that I was just speaking about, that's not from God. Get it. 
everything that God makes, what does Satan do? You tell me. He imitates. It's what he does. Satan is a master imitator. So if we got good music, Satan's going to make sure we get bad music. If we have the right kind of videos, Satan's going to make sure we get the wrong kind of videos. It's who he is. He wants to infiltrate your homes. And we've had a policy in the Burge home, <clears throat> and we put this into practice. Whenever we'd have a video or something, and one time the Lord's name was used in vain, it went in the trash. If there was anything in it uh, that would demean our God, we didn't watch it. That kept us kind of limited, didn't it? And it put us in an era where we had to go back and to find a time going back to the 30s, 40s, and 50s to start to embrace more what was done back then that had respect for the family where dad wasn't the stupidest man on planet Earth. Have you noticed what's happened to the family in the last 40 years? We've gone uh, from Mr. Cleaver to Bart Simpson and Homer Simpson. We've gone from a respect with the family to blasphemy in the family. These things ought not to be child of God. So we need to make sure that we don't justify that God has redeemed the world. And I hear people use this kind of terminology. So therefore, because I'm a child of God, I can embrace all sorts of music. I can embrace all sorts of movies, and I can take it all in. No, you can't. Do you know, I joke with the congregation that I'm paid to be good, and you're good for what? Nothing. Okay. What do I mean by that? I spend my entire day studying God's word, praying this and that. I can't handle what this world has to offer. I can't sit and watch their music or watch their movies. I can't listen to their music and not be infiltrated. And I'm someone who spends the day with God. Where does that put you at that's exposed to so much more than I am? What chance do you have that you're going to walk away victorious because of the environment that you're in, the language that you might have to hear, the music that could be around you. I remember when I took my second job with the telephone company. I would type service orders. And as you came into the office in Hyattsville, there were about 35 monitors, and there were about 35 radios. And I remember hearing some of the most ungodly music that I had to listen to for seven hours that day, right? It's hard. So if you are being subjected to those things and then come home and choose that to put on the radio, choose that to put on a TV, do you really think for one moment that your kids are going to be morally upright? Do you think that they're really going to have the integrity that they need to have? I think we need to stop fooling ourselves. The allurements of this world are not from God. Verse 16, for all that is in the world. See, each thing separately and all of them together. And now let's begin the three things. The first one it is mentioned is the lust of the flesh. And by the way, the word lust there in verse 16 is a neutral word. It's epithemia. Paul uses it in Philippians 1.23 of having a desire to depart and lead and to go live with Christ. That's a good desire. But yet in 1 Peter 2.11, it says, Abstain from fleshly lust, which war against the soul. The lust of the flesh is what you have inherited from Adam that leans you in a direction to do what is wrong. That's the lust of the flesh. The second thing we have is the lust of the eye. Solomon, who had seen a lot, says in Ecclesiastes 1.8, the eye is not satisfied with seeing. Solomon adds, how many wives, how many concubines, and he says, it just didn't fulfill me. Godliness with contentment is great gain. Only God can make you content in your station of life. He says the eye is not satisfied with seeing. In Ecclesiastes 4.8, nor is his eyes satisfied 
with riches. Job got it. He understood. And remember what God said about Job? There was no one like him. But he made a covenant with his eyes. Job 31.1. How then can I look upon a young maid to lust? Men, are you that committed? Have you made a determination that you would not have anything before you that causes you to lust and you're not going to look there? Jesus says it this way. Whoever looks upon a woman to lust has already committed a sin of adultery in his heart. Make a covenant with your eyes. Don't put that garbage in front of you. Make sure you do it right. The lust of the eyes, Satan uses it all the time. The third area he hits you up with is the pride of life. Pride of life. Come over with me, please, to James chapter 4. The word pride only occurs twice in the Greek New Testament. Here in 1 John 2, 16, and we'll see it in just a moment in James chapter 4. Now, in James 4, 13, I want you to... Think about the word self. Uh, we're going to see the word self in three aspects of this verse. First of all, this world encourages us to be self-assertive. How many of you have heard of training like that? You have to learn how to be self-assertive, right? We get told this garbage all the time. Verse 13, come now, you who say, today or tomorrow we will go to such a such a city, right? Think about it. This is what I'm going to do tomorrow. Self-assertive. Do you know you've got tomorrow? <laughs> Does anybody know that he has tomorrow? Not only self-assertive, but I want you to see, second of all, self-confident. Self-confident. Because the individual says, we'll spend a year there. I'm making the schedule. I'm going to go there going to spend a year there. And then we see, thirdly, um, is the idea of self-centered. And this is the idea with business. And we're going to buy and sell and make a profit. In other words, I'm the master of my faith. Fate. I'm going to make choices. This is what I'm going to do because it's about me. Verse 14. Whereas you do not know what will happen tomorrow. For what is your life? Is it even a vapor that appears for a little time and then vanishes away? Instead, you ought to say, if the Lord wills, we shall live and do this or that. But now you boast in your arrogance. See the word arrogance? That's the word pride back in 1 John 2.16. All such boasting is evil. Now, let me illustrate first a negative and then a positive example of this whole idea of the three temptations. Got to go back to the book of beginnings, book of Genesis. Genesis chapter 3. Would you turn there? And I want you to see this for yourselves, my friends. Satan is described as the serpent. I saw the other day that there was a... They called him a snake whisperer in Malaysia. I don't know if you saw the story. A cobra, and he, would, he was um, always interacting with the snakes, not afraid to play with the snakes, catch the snakes, whatever. And guess what happened finally? Snake bit him. He died uh, several days later. You play with the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, it's going to bite you, and it will take you down. Just will. It, it, you, you're just no match for it, anyone. Do you understand that? You are no match for these things. And you know what makes me even sadder? Is so many children of God just lie down and just take it all in. They're not even in a battle. Some of us wake up every day, Lord, keep us from these things. Give me the victory. Others just go and they just, this is part of their life. Genesis 3, and the serpent was more cunning. By the way, that word cunning is translated as prudent often in the Proverbs, because when you use wisdom rightly, it's prudence. But when you use it to manipulate others, it's cunning. He was more cunning than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, 
Notice what he does. He questions God's word. Has God indeed said you shall not eat of every tree of the garden? And a woman said to the serpent, we may eat the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree, which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, and the you here, by the way, in the Hebrew is plural. See, Adam and Eve, you shall not eat it, nor shall you, once again, plural, touch it, lest you die. Then the serpent said to the woman, you will not surely die. And that's what Satan's been whispering into some of your ears. Go ahead and take in the violence. Go ahead and take in the immorality. Go ahead and take in the godless music. It's not going to impact you. God's holding back on you. I get on my treadmill every day, 30, 40, 45 minutes. Little worship session. Got my Christian music going, ready to praise the Lord. I always have to watch because you, know, you got to hold on once in a while and you want to put the hands up. It's some of the best 45 minutes of the day. Why? Because my music challenges me. My music talks to me. My music, because it's Christian in focus, gets in my face and challenges me. That's what I need. I need to be preached to. I need to be reminded how weak I am. I need to be told how proud I can be. Make good choices. Make good choices. Notice verse 6 now. Anybody there in Genesis 3? So when the woman saw that the tree was, here's the lust of the flesh, good for food. That it was pleasant to the eyes. That's the lust of the eyes. And a tree desirable to make one wise. Pride of life. She took of its fruit and ate. She also gave to her husband with her, and he ate. And notice what happened. Their eyes were open, and they knew they were naked. Does that get your attention there? And remember what God had said back in Genesis 2, 17? To Adam, the day that you eat of the tree, you shall surely die. Flip a couple pages, go to chapter 5. And you will see that Adam lived 930 years. And guess what he did, everyone? He died. And what have we been enduring since then? Suffering and death. Satan has had thousands of years to perfect his techniques. He uses the same three things all the time. It's the lust of the flesh. It's the lust of the eyes. And it's the pride of life. And they come at you every day. He owns this world system. So he is going to do everything that he can to bring you down. And think about it. Adam and Eve were innocent. They were not created with a sin nature. You and I have the old man, according to Romans 6.6. 6. Within us, because what we have inherited from Adam is the propensity, the inclination to do what is wrong. And when you feed that inclination, you're going down. It's that simple. So that's the negative example of the three temptations. Now for a positive one, Matthew chapter 4. Now let me ask you a question as you're turning to Matthew 4. Who do you want to counsel you? The individual that has wrecked his life, her life repeatedly, and has said, well, look, I, you know, I have had seven failed marriages. My kids don't talk to me anymore, but you know, let me counsel you about the family. Or do you want to hear from someone that has done it right, that has walked with God, that has known victory experientially? Christ is my champion. I don't turn to Oprah. I, I don't turn to Dr. Phil. I don't turn to those who use this world system and its means to give me advice. My champion is the one who is tempted in all points like I am, yet without sin. I want to go to the one that can tell me experientially how I can have a victory. Meet him. Matthew 4, Jesus is led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. I was in this area that they traditionally believe is the wilderness. It's a rock, rocky, barren area. And when he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights afterward, he was hungry. It was a supernatural fast. Verse 3, now when the tempter came to him, 
He said, and the if here is a first class condition, he knows who Jesus is. If you are the Son of God, command that these stones become bread. See the appeal to the lust of the flesh? Go ahead. Don't, don't ask your Father to provide. Just do it in your own strength. Notice in verse 4, but he answered and said, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Say, so no, stop there. Verse 5, then the devil took him up into the holy city, that's Jerusalem, and sent him on the pinnacle of the temple, where the southern and eastern walls met, overlooking the Kidron Valley was a large drop. Satan takes Jesus there. And he said to him, if you are the Son of God, throw yourself down. You want to talk about the pride of life? Those individuals that say, I pulled myself up by my own bootstraps. If it weren't for the grace of God, you and I would accomplish nothing. If he doesn't give us our next breath, if he doesn't give us the next idea, if he doesn't speak through us and live through us, we're done. But what is Satan trying to do? Show off, Jesus. Show everybody how powerful you are. Just go ahead and take the dive. Then let your angels come and make the rescue, and then everybody can see just how wonderful you are. Once again, Jesus quotes scripture. And now for the third temptation, down in verse 8. The devil took him up on an exceedingly high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. What did he do? He showed it to them. Can you imagine all that Satan shows Jesus? He does this to us all the time. He really does. He hits us up, sometimes we don't even know it, to cause us not to be content. Here's the lust of the flesh. Here's the lust of the eyes. Here's the pride of life. Take it in. Verse 9, he offers to Jesus all these things, if you will fall down and worship me. Well, he has them. Why? Because he's a prince of this world. Jesus says, away with you, Satan, for it is written, you shall worship the Lord your God and him only shall you serve. Worship, service. You see how they go hand and hand right here. So, number one, stop loving the world and serve only Jesus. Number two, the allurements of this world aren't from God. And as you're turning back with me to 1 John, let me give you point number three. Don't toy with the temporal, but toil with the eternal one. Don't toy with the temporal, but toil with the eternal one. Down in verse 17, notice here, this world system, that means that all that pertains to the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. Remember what John said we saw earlier, that the world is passing away? Why? It's because the true light is already shining. For you and me, the moment we came to Christ, we became a new creation. 2 Corinthians 5 says, old things have passed away. In essence, you and I now have a capacity, child of God, that when we are hit up with the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, by the grace of God, we can say, no! I'm not on your leash any longer, Satan. We all walked according to the course of this world. We all walked according to the prince of the power of the air. But now we can put in his place God's music. And we can put in his place the things that would please God visually. See, we need to start to live in such a way. And some of you are sitting there and you're going, that's been my problem. That's why my family has moved in this direction. This is why I'm having the struggles that I have. It's because which nature are we going to feed? The world is passing away. Glenn Barker writes, it's a corpse not yet buried. Ha! So why am I going to latch on to the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life? It's temporary. Good old Hugh Hefner, remember the one who gave us Playboy magazine? Living in this little mansion from a lot of people's eyes, he had arrived. But your life is but a vapor. 
Moses would say, who, by the way, conducted hundreds of thousands of funerals into 40 years in the wilderness, so teach us to number our days that we might gain a heart full of wisdom. Oh, don't get me wrong. Sin can be fun for a while, but lust is never fulfilled. It wants more of you, more of you, more of you, more of you. Moses understood that. When he could have had wine, women, and song, he could have stayed in Egypt and had it all and enjoy the passing pleasures of sin, he said, no. I'd rather identify with God's people and be persecuted. <laughs> Was he a nut job? No, he had just had a view on eternity. And that's what we need to do, looking unto Jesus. This life is but a vapor. It comes and it goes. And we have to look forward. We have to fight the good fight. And listen to me, everybody. It's a battle. Each and every day you wake up, you're in the battle. And the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life are being hurled at you by Satan. He has an ally in your own nature. That's why Paul says honestly and transparently, in 1 Timothy 1.15, he calls himself, and he uses a present tense verb, I am the chief of sinners. So for all of us, join the club. When you see the glory of the Lord, you recognize that you are nothing. And that's what Isaiah saw. And he said, woe is me, I'm a man of unclean lips. I dwell in the midst of an unclean people, but my eyes have seen the Lord of hosts, you know, the God of glory. See, when you see Jesus, this garbage of this world is not appealing. It has nothing for you. It has nothing for you. Why would you ever want to go to the temporal when within your life already is the eternal? The world is passing away and it's lust. But he who does the will of God and does here is a present tense participle. It's a way of life. You're continually doing these things. It says abides forever. Whew. That's what Jesus saw that Adam and Eve did not see. So you're going to have to ask, which model do I want? Do I want to go back with Adam and Eve and follow the path of suffering and death and defeat? Or do I want to be that unusual individual, like Job, who goes, you know what? I'm going to put my blinders on. Yeah, I know what she looks like, but I'm not looking because I know where that takes me. In closing, turn with me to Romans chapter 12. You and I have no excuse. We just had communion. All of us had to bow our heads. All of us had to close our eyes. We had to look back at our lives, and I know what you did, what I did. Well, Lord, here's where I blew it. Here's where I missed it. Forgive me, forgive me, forgive me, right? And if we confess our sins, he forgives us. But every time we sin, we don't have to. We don't have to. My little children, these things I write to you that you may not sin. But if you sin, you have an advocate, a go-between with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous one. See, in the book of Romans, we are shown from 118 through 320 something you and I already know. We're all sinners. <laughs> Welcome to the club. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And see the word sin there? Past tense verb. In Adam, our representative, he went there to the Garden of Eden in the best of circumstances, and he failed. So guess what we get to be? Part of the Adam family. Don't go. Okay. Right? But it doesn't end there. Because once you understand how sinful you are, then from Romans 3.21 to 5.21, we are shown justification. God is on the bench gavel in hand, the moment we believe in Jesus Christ who died for our sin, conquered death, God strikes the bench and says, not guilty. Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God. But it doesn't end there. We then go from being sinners to being saved to sanctification. Big term, all it means, the process of God, whereby he is conforming all of us 
to the image of Jesus Christ daily. That's God's goal. You say, Pastor, what's God's goal for my life? It's simple. Jesus wants you to be like him. That's Romans chapter 8 and verse 29. You have been predestined, marked out ahead of time to be like Jesus Christ. So in Romans 6 through 8, we have a section on sanctification. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin, given into the lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, and pride of life, that God's grace might show forth, God forbid. How shall we who died to sin? You see the picture, everybody? When Jesus died, positionally, because he died for you, you died with him. That's why Paul says in Galatians 2.20, I have been crucified with Christ. And you've heard me say it, but I'll say it again. Give me the dead man in the casket lying right here. Bring in Miss America in the high heels, and I'm telling you, that guy, he ain't going to look once. Or bring by the nicest car that you can't afford. Or bring by the latest movie out there that you're enticed to see, but you know why you can't watch it. And bring it in front of the dead guy. And the dead guy, he just doesn't respond. Why? Because he's dead. And you and I are dead in our connection with Christ. We have been co-crucified with Christ. But as a result of that, Romans 6, 4 says we walk in a newness, a new quality of life. Man, victory comes when we finally have overcome what used to kick our derriers. I can't watch violence because I'd be prone to beat some of you up on my bad day. You get out of line, instead of Moses hitting the, the, the stick twice, hitting against a rock, I'd hit you. Going to work. God had taught me about my position with Christ in the right lane, 55 miles an hour. A lady behind me doesn't like them doing a speed limit, pulls up next to me and gives me a gesture that really wasn't kind. Back in the day, I would have went ballistic. I just smiled and said, you know what? I'm saved. I don't have to respond to that anymore. Have a nice day. And I just went on to work doing my 55. Why? Because I'm a new creature, new creation in Christ. Wish I could tell you I did that all the time, but you get the idea. You can too. But it depends on the nature you want to feed. And in Romans chapter 8, you're as good as glorified, says the Apostle Paul. So with this in mind, now pick it up in chapter 12 of Romans, and we're going to close out on this. But that fork is before you, dear friend, and you're going to have to make a choice today which way you're going to go. And it's going to mean all the difference in the world. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God. I love the word mercies. God's given us what we don't deserve. That you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable, or well-pleasing to God, which is your reasonable service. It makes sense. You deserve what I deserve is death and eternal separation from God. So what does God do? He takes his only son, sends him down here, who's rejected by his own family, who's rejected by his own nation, to be betrayed by Judas, to be nailed to a cross after he was scourged, which meant to be beaten brutally, hangs on a cross between two thieves. And he did all of that with us in mind. Has anybody ever done more for you than that? On the third day, he conquers death. And then he goes to his disciples and says, Hey, all authority has been given to me. You go now and make disciples of all the nations. And I ask you this question, how can we not go? He left glory to come down here to have his mommy change his diaper, to be rejected by his own family, and to suffer people hurling insults at him and spitting at him, accusing him of being born of fornication. Anybody ever done that much for you? It's your reasonable service to say, he laid it all down for me. Guess what? Now it's time for you to lay it all down for him. I mean, everything. You get it, everybody? Everything. You take your 10%, Lord first. Does he need your money? No. But he wants to test your faith. 
He wants to see if you really can trust him as your provider. He wants you to say church, a priority, Bible study daily, a priority, prayer, a priority. Why? He wants you to make him first in all things. And that's what Colossians 1.18 says. That in all things, Christ might have the preeminence. And then in verse 2, and don't be conformed, and that's a command, by the way, it really has the idea is don't be fashioned with or fashioned unto. Don't be squeezed into the model of this world with this lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, and pride of life. Don't let it squeeze you into its model. Some time ago on my Facebook account, I saw a pastor who was so excited. I don't know if his kid was turning 10 years old and he was going to watch James Bond with him. I thought, Really? You know, when it says in uh, Hebrews, lest there be any fornicator like Esau, lest there be any fornicator like James Bond. So here's a pastor, a man in the ministry, who's now going to introduce his son into the world of immorality. I'm going, are you serious? Christ died to set us free from this, not to be fed into this. That's the world in which we live. And you wonder why sometimes churches are getting so big? First John says about some of the leaders, they speak of the world, and the world hears them. They're just like them. That's why Joe Olstein can talk to you about the better life, and we'll go, wow, we want to have it smooth. Never mention suffering. Never mention persecution. As Joyce Meyer gets on her jet and flies all around with these little cozy messages for cozy people. Right? Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. In my old King James Bible, I have a date written going back to about 1980 where it says to be renewed in the spirit of your mind. And I said, Lord, I need that. I had a short life up to that point, but there's a lot of stuff up here that didn't need to be up there, and I need to change my mind. I need to memorize scripture. I need to put out the garbage. I need to have a holy washing. I've been working at this for 40 years. It ain't perfect. But I know one thing, I'm not what I was. And I know one thing, I know what I'm feeding. And I understand what my daily priority is because my main objective as your pastor is to walk with God and to please Him so that I can come and lead you and say, hopefully come imitate me as I imitate Christ. But if I'm a follower of James Bond, and if I'm a follower of all that is ungodly out there, then how dare I come in front of you and say, now this is how you need to live. We have a word for that. It's called hypocrisy, right? Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. And, you know, my question is to you today, are you ready to get on the altar and stay on the altar? You know, the animal sacrifice had to be quite interesting because I don't think any animal said, oh, slay me, please. I'm sure when the high priest got the animal, it was somewhat of a tussle at times. God is calling us to get on the altar. In other words, say, Lord, here am I. Present your body. Their probably body is speaking about the whole of you spirit, soul, and body, and you jump on the altar, and all you do is this. You say, God, take all of me. Where you need to correct me and change me, change me. If I need to go home and start pitching some stuff in the trash, if I need to kneel down with my little kid and say, you know what? This isn't what I should have been doing. You humble yourself, and you do it. Your kids will respect you more than you can ever imagine when they see a mommy or a daddy or both getting on their knee and saying, I've just done this wrong, and I ask your forgiveness. I ask you and, you, and you work with the kids, and they see your transparency and that you're trying to grow, and guess what? The kids can say, that's a dad, that's a mom. You can ask any of my sons. I spend my time getting on my knees before them, telling them, you know what, I lost my temper here. That's not how a Christian is supposed to live. Or whatever the case might be. And there was always a transparency. Why? I wanted them to see they didn't have a perfect dad, but they have a dad who is trying to be conformed to the image of Christ, and I want them to follow that lead. It's that simple. And I want to just say this to you all, and I want to say this with the, with the utmost respect. I really don't care what everybody thinks about how I choose to lead my life. 
You know, you get to a point where you say, ultimately, one day, I'm standing before one person, and he knows me. <laughs> Does he know me? He's going to have those eyes like a flame of fire. He's going to look in my heart. He's going to know why I did what I did, and there's ultimately one that I need to please. That's it. That's what Paul says. You know, my aim, whether in the body or out of the body, is to be pleasing to him. That's it. That's all you need to do. So are you ready to get on the altar? Are you ready to say, Lord, I, I really need you to clean me up? There are some things you've already pointed out to me, but there's just a willingness, and that's what I try to live daily. I try to live my life that when the Spirit of God points out anything to me that I need to be getting out of my life, I just want to move in that direction. Because ultimately, I don't want to be a roadblock from knowing my God or from you knowing my God. Would you bow your heads? Would you close your eyes? And dear friend, when your head is bowed and your eyes closed, I'm preaching to me today too. I want you to understand that. I have one goal for you too. It's my goal. is to have you conform to the image of Jesus Christ. If you don't know him as your personal savior, right now is your opportunity. You turn from your sin, yourself, and you believe now. What, you, what is it that you need to believe in order to enter heaven one day? You believe that Jesus died personally for your sin. The one who knew no sin became sin for us. And then beside that, you believe that he was raised from the dead, which demonstrates that he's God. Would you do that right now? If you've never yet believed on Christ, take that moment. Tell him what he already knows. Dear God, I'm a sinner. But I now believe that Jesus died on the cross for my sin and that he was raised from the dead. And by faith, you tell him right now, you're receiving the gift of eternal life. Go ahead, take the gift. Just tell him, by faith, I receive that gift right now. If you've done that with no one looking, can you just raise that hand and say, Pastor, I want you to know, thank you. Uh, God spoke to me, thank you. Others today, thank you. I appreciate that so much. God bless you. Thank you. Thank you so much. And now, for those of us who know him, are you ready to get on the altar? That's my only question. And I, I say this in all sincerity. I don't care if you're 70 or 77. You know, people will tell me I'm too old to change, Pastor, and, and, and you can't teach an old dog new tricks. You're not a dog. You're a man or a woman made in the image of God, and he'll take you where you're at. Are you ready to get on the altar and say, God, I'm just presenting myself to you, a living sacrifice? If that's your desire today, no one's looking. Tell God that. God, I'm getting on the altar, and you just take me. And would you raise that hand and say, Pastor, I just want you to know I just got on the altar, and by God's grace, I'm not getting off the altar. Thank you. I'm seeing hands everywhere. God speaking today. Get on the altar. Thank you. Other hands, it's your chance. Thank you so much. God bless you all. God bless you all. Thank you. I see those hands. Let's pray.